Next speaker is uh, Sharon Moen from the University of Minnesota Sea Grant Program, and here we'll hear about a local chart. All right, good morning. Um, I'm Sharon Moen, the Senior Science Communicator at the University of Minnesota Sea Grant Program. And on behalf of Sea Grant, um, I'd like to welcome you to the Char Symposium in Duluth, birthplace of Bob Dylan, and uh, on the edge of a lake so vast it contains 10% of the Earth's freshwater resource, surface waters. Dr. Winfield did a fabulous job of introducing the cultural importance of Arctic char. But I'd like to add to his, a sidebar to his story. Back when potters were making pots for the char 100 years ago, uh, the future king of England came over to, the, to Lake Superior to go fishing for a different species of char. I actually even have pictures to prove it. Um, while visiting Canada in 1919, Prince Edward um, caught beautiful buxom coastal brook trout, which many refer to as coasters. Now, if I'm successful in the next 20 minutes, you, like Prince Edward, will become hooked on coasters because in the waters outside this very conference center, an ordinary brook char can grow into an extraordinary coaster. While living in Lake Superior for several years, um, common brook trout, which are about this big, can grow two to three times as big, um, at least double that of a typical brook char. I also want to reinforce that it's important, what you're doing here is very important. Communicating science. Allowing your work to factor in conversation decisions not only influences people on an individual scale, but it, it changes things on a global scale. It is exceedingly important to share your science that you've been conducting in a way that Homo sapiens, the complex, disastrous, glorious um, things that we are, can appreciate, use, and extend. My goal in this talk is to inspire you towards better and more science communication. So to set the scene for this story I'm about to tell, let's start with this map. This swath of North America is the original native range of brook trout. Mostly, the streams, rivers, and some lakes in this area are populated by the spunky little char. However, along the golden edges of this range, something funny can happen. In addition to coasters, which once upon a time occupied parts of all the Laurentian Great Lakes, there's another ecological variant that spends part of its life in the salty waters of the Atlantic seaboard or in Hudson Bay. These fish are sometimes called salters and can, like coasters, reach an impressively massive size. Now, apologies to the, those of you from places where brook trout are incredibly invasive. But here, in their native range, brook trout have some challenges. Here they are challenged by changing land use patterns, logging, um, mining now, Oh, dams and urbanization and pastures, um, invasive species, and more currently climate change. The current range of salters and coasters is just a shadow of what it once was. However, my story is actually one of hope. And in this story, you are here. The world record brook trout, a coaster, a 14 and a half pound beauty, was caught here about 100 years ago. A rival brook trout, an equally big um, salter, if you believe the records or the stories, was caught here 200 years ago. And if you want to break these records, try going here in September. It might set you back 10 grand in Canadian dollars, but wow, you'd have a story to tell. A tale maybe as legendary as Daniel Webster's. Never mind that Webster was a US senator. What drove Courier to reproduce this drawing on the, the right there by Tate, I guess you're left. <laughs> um, yes, you're left. Um, by Tate was that enormous brook trout Webster allegedly caught with his trusty rod old kill all on a Sunday, no less. Webster's salter is said to have matched the weight of the world record brook trout, a coaster caught by Dr. Cook of Ontario. But the account of that fateful day in 1827 is open to multiple interpretations. So the catch is unofficial. What is clear, though, is that the recreational fishing industry for brook trout has, long, has a long and storied history beginning about 300 years ago. 
Before that, certainly the First Nations and Native American peoples and a few settlers fished for fun, but not with the same damaging fervor that rod and reel clubs of colonial America set into motion when this part of the world, when Duluth, was barely a fur trading post. Historically, most of Lake Superior's shoreline and tributary streams supported coast or brook populations. These partially migratory brook trout milled about, getting big, getting fat. Their bigness and beauty were so hard to ignore that sportsmen from Boston, DC, New York, and Chicago, and even from the UK, Dr. Winfield, <laughs> um, came from droves to fish the epic Lake Superior coastal brook trout. Um, back in the 1860s, the road ended in Duluth. Wisconsin's Brule River was a whistle stop, letting off sports from to out on the River of Presidents, it was called at the time. Nipigon was almost inaccessible. Once upon a time, this was the end of the world, rather like parts of Alaska are now, or the Kolin Peninsula in Russia. Unregulated, unregulated fishing decimated the coaster stocks like it did salter stocks six, 70 years earlier. About the same time, axes were in literal full swings. In the 1900s, the Minnesota lumber industry felled over 2.3 billion board feet of white pine, enough to build a boardwalk three meters wide encircling the earth at the equator. In each year of the next decade, equal cuts of pine were made. Silt flowed from the land while log jams scoured the stream beds. Old waters were flooded and river mouths were radically altered. All of this ruined brook trout habitat. And then there were the dams. Even on the Nipigon River, famous for the size and quantity of his brook trout, four dams dented the coaster population. Coasters held on in Nipigon, though. The river is just so damn big. But they barely did elsewhere. By 1930, coasters were little more than a mere memory around Lake Superior and impossible to find in Lakes Michigan and Huron. Fast forward 88 years. It's 2018. Things have changed. Silver trout went extinct. We've had a world war, a cold war, rock and roll, flower power, moonwalking, more moonwalking, and the internet. <laughs> Meanwhile, especially since the 90s, fisheries managers and scientists have put considerable effort into coaster conservation. Thanks to advances in genetic studies, which you'll hear about in the next presentation, we've learned something important about coasters and salters. Multiple studies indicate that they are genetically similar to the other brook trout in their natal streams. They're ecological variants of ordinary brook trout. Just like some farmer's kids hear the call of the sea, behavioral variation allows some brook trout to wander out of their home streams. Brook trout exhibit partial migration. Some go to the lake in our coasters, some go to the sea in our salters. Some stay home and remain as brookies. As some of us concluded at the reception last night, thanks Fred, wherever you are, <laughs> um, we've uh, decided that brook trout are weird, beautiful, and adaptable. However, we've also found out that even though coaster, coasters are genetically similar to the stream resident fish from whence they came, you can't just stock them in lakes and streams with brook trout. Well, you just can't stock the lakes and streams with brook trout and end up with coasters. Despite them being adaptable, Brook trout are a little fussy about their water. They are partial to the stream in which they hatched, and if they migrate into the Lake Superior, they typically return to their natal streams or nearby to spawn. Not only have we learned quite a bit about coasters themselves, science-based fisheries management has also advanced. After the sharp drop in coaster abundance, anglers pressured the government into making management, into managing, managing populations. Management strategies included stocking, an effort that by and large failed to yield self-sustaining populations. They also included initial harvest restrictions that were too liberal and failed to curtail the collapse of many coaster stocks. These regulations have changed over time in a way that is boosting coaster numbers around Lake Superior, especially in Ontario. Federal, state, provincial, and tribal resource agencies can have different perspectives on the importance of an ecological variant. That's why it's important that they work together under the Great Lakes Fishery Commission which provides a mechanism for coordinating restoration strategies. And a workshop was held in 20, oh, 2004 to do just that for coaster brook trout. Habitat restoration has also, also changed things for coasters. Sports clubs and organizations like those listed on the slide have and continue to put considerable time and money into developing conservation ethics. 
supporting applied science, and conducting conservation projects that favor habitat rehabilitation. They've been essential in angler education and changing cultural attitudes in a region where much of recreational fishing is still for subsistence. It is very challenging sometimes to convince anglers to release an 18-inch fish that they'd rather eat. Now, many in the audience here have added to the serrated edge of knowledge that is helping to improve coastal brook trout management, and for this, I thank you. You've been asking if, through sand traps and substrate size, can we make better habitat? You've studied behavior, distribution, movement patterns, and genetics. You've developed models, and I applaud those of you who have incorporated citizen scientists into your research. It is incredibly valuable to engage stakeholders in the process of science. We know vastly more about coastal brook trout now than we did a century ago. We know recovery relies on managing angler expectations and fishing pressure. We realize that stream conditions and spawning habitat are critical. We've got to rehabilitate streams, especially those with remnant populations, suitable gravel, and inflowing groundwater. Stream flow stability, shade cover, water temperature, they're all important. As is keeping an eye on forestry and land use practices, as well as invasive species. Coasters aren't genetically different, so why do people who are not in this room and who are not necessarily anglers, anglers care about coasters? What makes these things precious? Now, I'm on the board of the Greater Lake Superior Foundation, a nonprofit that formed to protect and enhance the cold water resources of Lake Superior and its tributaries. Very few of the thousands of people being reached with Coaster News through the Foundation's Facebook page have ever, have ever caught or seen a coaster, yet they are engaging, commenting, and sharing posts at a rate I consider astonishing. Engagement means that somebody clicked on, commented on, or shared the post. Engagement rates are the number of engagements divided by the number of followers. A 1% engagement rate is considered pretty good. Uh, for nonprofits, um, a Facebook engagement rate of about a quarter of a percent was the average in 2017. Now, the Greater Lake Superior Foundation's most popular post in the last year achieved a 600% engagement rate. In the last few months, engagement rates have ranged from 7% to 177%. Yesterday, I posted about the Char Symposium. That is already uh, has a 15% engagement rate, and that's less than 24 hours old. So clearly, people care about coasters. So why do people gauge like this? Maybe it's because this remarkable jewel-like fish has such a huge potential. Maybe it's because their history is our history, and their future is our future, and their future seems kind of promising. Humans have always sought out big animals, or coveted the rare and spectacular, the nearly unobtainable. We mourn the loss of cultural icons and identities. By any measure, biodiversity is declining. Species are vanishing, populations are extirpated. Half the species on the IUCN red list are of critically endangered species are aquatic. As I mentioned, silver trout went extinct by 1930. Other species of trout went extinct in the last few years. Miraculously, one of them reappeared. You care about char, you know this. We need to keep sharing the news of science. Researchers conducted a survey in France during which they asked hikers if they liked amphibians. About half said yes, but 40% said they did not know whether they liked amphibians or not. How do you not know if you like amphibians? How can you not love that face? <laughs> the opportunity for raising public awareness and engagement is vast. Now, last September, only nine months ago, this animal, heavy, hairy, and strange, wandered out of the forest and across the Oder River from Poland into Germany. People panicked. It must be dangerous. They thought it had to be killed. A local official gave the order to shoot. On the other side of the river, in Poland, the news of the gunshot reached conservationists who went ballistic. They had worked for years to increase the population of Vicent, a species whose conservation status is vulnerable. An article in the New York Times listed a lack of knowledge as a threat to the Vicent's chance of persisting. Lack of awareness because of weakness in communication does not sit well with me. And it would astound me if it sat well with you. People ought to, no, make that society needs to, have access to your expertise and research. 
whether you study coastal brook trout, arctic char, frogs, or European bison. If you haven't read Grand Challenges in the Management and Conservation of North American Inland Fisheries, fish, fish as, and fisheries, please do. The authors identified roadblocks that, remo if removed, would help solve major challenges facing manage fisheries management and long-term conservation. What impressed me about this article were the number of references to the importance of extending the broader impacts of science. In fact, the authors suggest making public education and outreach a mandatory component of scientific grants. This expectation that science will facilitate the broader reach of the, the work is already required by Minnesota Sea Grant, the Greater Lakes Fishery Commission, some science, National Science Foundation grants, and the National Natural Environment Research Council in the UK. So, you've been put on notice. People want to hear about char, and there's a growing expectation that you will tell your stories of science outside this convention center and beyond the, your favorite academic journals. To tell a story that hits people in the gut, recognize that the baseline audience has shifted in the last 10, 100 years. Demographics have shifted. Culture has changed. Communication has changed. And our ways of experiencing nature have changed. Somehow in this story, show continuing change while acknowledging the past. Coasters and salters have an important place in the local and multinational history here, in Canada, the US, and within tribes of the region. To only talk about the future strips communities of their reference points. Additionally, past focused messages resonate more with people who identify as conservatives. They tend to evaluate today relative to the way things were with an ideology that can be traced to the desire to defend the status quo, tradition, and conformity. Making environmental comparisons past focused allows conservative people to uphold their values. Aspirational or future focused messages tend to interest people who identify as liberals. The idea Earth is our home resonates with climate experts and the general public, including climate change deniers. Earth is home was also the most likely to make people think of the planet as a complex system. It is also accurate. In addition to telling your science stories to each other, and frankly to whomever you can corner, here's what I'd hope you'll do. Let people in and get them out. Um, let people know about your work, let them into the science. Consciously contribute to the stream of information that people are exposed to, be they butchers or bakers or candlestick makers. Most people will learn from lasting attitudes toward flora and fauna based on the limited information they encounter. This is especially true when there's a large volume of in misinformation. One study found that when 13 to 28 percent of the information people encounter is incongruent with their beliefs, they will begin to doubt themselves and seek out more information. Tell multiple stories on multiple platforms, including ones about habitat, ecological processes, and species, and function. Use mass media, blogs, infographics, art installation, and publish public speaker series. Foster broader communities of attachment via social media by employing imagery and discourse that attaches people to species and to habitats. And then get people outside. Studies consistently show that information alone typically does not result in increased conservation. Creating opportunities for people to experience nature, including citizen science, increases awareness and leads to action. I also encourage you to work with the determination and hope. Curiosity brought you to science and brought you here. Minnesota Sea Grants Director John Downing often reminds people that science is hope. And I trust you will find hope here today. Society needs hope, curiosity, joy, and humanity, and those are the traits that you share with your public audiences. Share your joy and curiosity with others. Although it might be a touch early to say that coasters of Lake Superior or the salters of the eastern seaboard are recovered, I think it's safe to say the signs are so far very positive. They're very hopeful, though climate change could be a huge game-changing setback. In this novel, The River Y, that I brought up on stage, the protagonist, Gus, runs across a fisherman philosopher named Titus, who says, fishing is nothing but the pursuit of the elusive. I say, being a scientist is like fishing. Answers and new ideas can be as elusive as fish, 
especially the large fish, especially the eureka answers and the big ideas. I and my co-authors hope that you land some crazy big ideas at this symposium this week. I know they're out there, just like the coasters. So I want to thank you for your time and attention, and thank you for the work that you do. I also want to send out a special thanks to my co-authors, Dr. Michael Searson, Scott Thorpe, and Maria Mannion, and also to Don Schreiner, Dennis Pratt, Catherine Schmidt, and Vic Stark for all the ways in which they contributed to this presentation. And with that, I would love to take questions.